Derek, I posted a uh, blog today, and uh, the, the blog title was Heuristics Form Chains of Lies. And I thought that was a pretty good clickbaity title. Maybe it's not. Maybe nobody will read it. But I wanted to, I wanted to get into that because I think it's, um, these are always good points, I think, at the end of the year when we have the, uh, the benefit of 2020 hindsight, looking back at the year and looking at some of the mistakes investors made, all of us, uh, you know, at some point in time, make some sort of a mistake. And the story that was told, the story that actually unfolded, a lot of times are completely different stories. Mm -hmm. So let's first start out. What, what is a heuristic? Do you know what a heuristic is? I believe it is like a, uh, like kind of like a quick way, like a quick rule of thumb, to, a way to think about something. Is essentially You're exactly right. Yep, yeah. it's uh, common sense. It's rule of thumb. It's nothing scientific. Uh, a couple examples would be: um, don't walk between a mother bear and her cub, right? Or don't pick up that hot coal that you see there in the campfire. Or there's dark clouds overhead. You might want to bring a rain, you know, uh, umbrella with you to work. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And heuristics were good and are good, right? They have kept people safe for thousands of years. And those examples of the heuristics that I just gave you will keep people safe for thousands of more years, assuming that the human species is still around because that information- And bears. Does, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, and bears. We need bears to stay around too. But heuristics can be a potential problem when it comes to investing. These rules of thumb. Right. So mm -hmm. the first the first one would be a simple heuristic, uh, and that is labeling something good or bad. Right. You could lab label a stock good or bad. Uh, and it could be because of what's called availability heuristics. You're only judging it by the information that is available at the time. Right. And you could have looked over. You could have looked at fantastic investments like Apple or Amazon or the S&P 500, which over time have proven to be great uh, investments. Right. But there were periods of time where you could have looked at those investments and say, that's a bad stock to own. Or th that index is bad because from 2000 to 2003, the S&P 500 lost value three straight years in a row. And so you could have said, this is, a, this is a bad investment to be in. And you'd have been wrong, right? You'd have been wrong by labeling it good or bad. I think there's a, uh, to get philosophical, I think there's maybe an extension there with that idea of uh, labeling it good or bad. I don't think that events in the market or events in your life are good or bad. That's the label that we place on them. They just are, right? If the S&P 500 drops 10%, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. You know, I could look at it from a price point saying it's actually more stable now, right? It's a, it's a more stable investment to be in. So, Or if you were shorting, it good, you'd be like, this is fantastic. <laughs> yes, right? Well, then you're wrong, right? And it, it, it is what it is. It just is. Mm -hmm. It's not good or bad, it just is. And you, you made the wrong bet. Uh, the other thing you can get into is with these heuristics, you've got the, um, you know, the availability. You're, you're only making decisions based on what the available knowledge is. Uh, an example of that might be you could look at the price movement of a stock, and if it jumps by 10% in a single day, just by the available knowledge, if all you, all you know is the ticker symbol and, and the name of the stock, you could assume that that stock is a good stock to own. Uh, and then, so you make an investment, and then a day later, you discover that it was a result of a short squeeze, right? And you, you better get out of that soon before it comes crashing back down. There are heuristics that are based on uh, past experience, right? So an example that I could maybe relate to with investing is that, is you could look at the past recession and you could say, look at that. Value stocks performed pretty well, relatively speaking, in the past recession. So if I think the market could face some headwinds, value stock should actually be what I want to be in, right? And mm -hmm. many investors, including us in, in portions of our portfolio, added that value stock thinking for the same reason. If, if anything, we're going to find some stability if this market uh, continues to be jumpy. And what did we find in 2023? The high-flying, fabulous seven tech stocks, the Meta, the NVIDIAs, the Microsoft, those were the stocks that actually acted defensive. And the value stocks were the ones that uh, lost value and underperformed. Uh, you can label certain stocks or sectors defensive, and that's, that's a trap because as we've seen, some sectors that are traditionally defensive may not be defensive uh, all the time. So I think um, 
when you're getting into heuristics, these rules of thumb with investing, I think that you're setting yourself up for a trap. And here's the here's why I call this a chain of lies. Because you get into these heuristics, these rules of thumb that you think are true, but don't always hold up. And then what you start looking for is what, Derek, we talk about all the time, this confirmation bias. This, mm -hmm. the ability to go out there and find data that supports your opinion, even if your opinion is wrong, right? You, you're, an example of this would be, you know, I think that there are signs of cracks in the economy. I think the economy is ready to go. So I'm going out there and I'm pointing to interest rates and I'm pointing to housing market data and I'm pointing to unemployment to support my opinion. Uh, and, and this was a great year to show that, right? Because many, many analysts thought that a recession could happen in 2022. And if it didn't, it was likely to happen in 2023. Well, here, here we are in December of 2023 and there's not a recession in sight. So uh, now, you know, it's, it's on to the next year, right? 2024 is the likely time that that could happen. And that might be the case, right? Because there is always a recession that's looming. That is just the, the business cycle, right? You've got expansion and you've got contraction that takes place. But there's a danger in, um, you know, if you, if you got too defensive during that period of time and you say that I'm just gonna hold my, you know, my cards here until I'm proven right, well, you proven right could be 10 years. I mean, we've seen stretches of time in the market where it is high priced, it is um, way above its average, you know, PE ratios for an extended period of time. Especially um, like the concentration of that too. So it's like looking at the average of this, the S&P 500 as an average of 500, so a weighted average of 500 stocks. Uh, it's above the, the historic average PE ratio. But I mean, most of that is concentrated in those seven stocks. So if you look at the the weighted average PE of the, the Magnificent Seven, it's like over 30, which is like way above the historical average of the S&P 500. And then the rest, the S&P 493 is, uh, I believe it's below the average. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but if you break it down like that, it gets even crazier. Yeah, I think that's a new index that you should consider opening the uh, S&P 493. It hasn't been good this year. <laughs> No, it has not. It has not. I have I have another uh, heuristic for you. Another investing heuristic would be uh, sixty forty. So like um, that's kind of like a rule of thumb based on a decent amount of data that stocks and bonds have been uncorrelated. But the the curveball that threw that out the window essentially was uh, inflation. When you have high inflation, the correlation between stocks and bonds uh, converges pretty close to one. They become pretty pretty correlated because they go up and down for the same reasons. So that, that's that's kind of one that a heuristic where if you would have followed for the past two decades, you would have been all right. But uh, the one time that it doesn't work and you put all your eggs in that basket, you could you could get uh, hurt pretty bad. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because that kind of goes into my uh, earlier statement of labeling something defensive. And a lot of times we would look at um, at bonds, right? We would look at bonds and think that bonds are conservative. Well, shoot, all you got to do is pull up the uh, the chart for the uh, iShares 20 plus treasuries, the TLT ticker symbol, anything but conservative at that time, right? Because it's it's lost massive amounts of, of its asset value over a period of time. The Vanguard total bond market has, has suffered the same thing. So to your point, that 60-40 portfolio set and forget, last year it was anything but that. Yeah, especially if you consider it on a risk adjusted basis too, because like something like Bitcoin is like uh, insanely volatile. So like you could have these 80% drawdowns, but you also have upside of whatever. I mean, it's up over 100% this year uh, and peak to trough. Um, Bitcoin is now outperforming the TLT, the long duration bond index. It's Bitcoin obviously drew down more, but where we are right now, if you measure it from the top to bottom, uh, TLT has actually drawn down more. So even on a risk adjusted basis, like you're probably not even going to capture a lot of that upside for, for a really long time, especially if you're just banking on buying it and uh, collecting yields. So, I mean, uh, it, it looks especially bad on a risk adjusted basis. Yeah. So much of investing has to do with uh, controlling that mental landscape. And I think you wanted to get into some maybe cognitive, uh, disbeliefs or, or contradictions that we can run into as investors. Yeah, so this is actually from the, the CFA curriculum. I thought it was pretty interesting. This kind of, you know, interesting to talk about on the podcast. A lot of the CFA curriculum is just reading balance sheets and income statements. That stuff's not as interesting, but this might be. 
Uh, so it's yeah, just three um, cognitive errors that investors commit when um, uh, like analyzing companies. Essentially, the first one would be you kind of touched on would be overconfidence. Uh, so this this is a a good example. Um, so give me a ninety percent confidence interval for the length of the Nile River. The length okay, of the Nile so River. Yeah, oh, give me geez. a ninety percent confidence interval. So are you asking me in, in miles how long it is? No, I'm asking for a like you would be ninety percent confident that the length of the Nile River fell between value A and value B. Give me give me the the range that you think it would fall into. That you would be ninety percent confident. I honestly don't know if I have a confidence interval uh, for the length of the Nile River. I wouldn't even know how to wager. I guess, uh, but I'll throw one out here for you. Um, 90% confident it's uh, 10,000 miles or less. So you'd say between zero and 10,000 miles, that would be your, your confidence interval. So it's, I think it's a 41 or 4,153. The only reason I know this is because this was in the CFA curriculum. Uh, so you, you actually did not commit the, the cognitive error, but 50% of people will construct confidence intervals that do not contain the length of the Nile River. I didn't give you any parameters on which to construct your confidence interval, you could have said between zero and two billion, and it would have you would have been ninety percent confident that it would have fell in there. But yeah, so fifty percent of people do not construct a confidence interval that contains the length of the Nile River. So that's overconfidence because you believe that, uh, you know, your your arbitrary uh, confidence interval that you know nothing about the length of the Nile River. You're like this this will be good enough, but you have no. Uh, prior knowledge about it so you should set extremely large confidence intervals so that's an example of overconfidence but congratulations you did not commit the the cognitive error the the overconfidence it's funny because so one of the reasons why i may have not made that error is because i had no idea how long the Nile river was so i tried to i knew it was probably over a thousand and i you know i picked something that was what's the distance across the united states is it five thousand some, somewhere around there i actually don't know so there you go. Either. I don't know. Ninety percent right? confidence so, would be like zero in a billion. <laughs> so, Derek, you remember? Was it uh, 2019, 2020? Uh, one of those years. It didn't matter what stock you own. If it was a growth stock, it was it was going crazy, right? And mm-hmm. I think there was a lot of error in the sense that a lot of investors felt that the return in their portfolio was coming from them, right? They were that good at picking mm-hmm. the stocks. And what we found out the following year is uh, no, not so much uh, because those ones. But overconfidence plays a large, large, large role in not only uh, I think perceived uh, perceived arrogance as far as how these returns are actually coming. And I don't mean arrogance in a bad way. I mean just uh, maybe sure. arrogance is not the right word. Maybe it is uh, overconfidence. Is, is it's literally, I think that's probably the, the right word. Yeah. That actually, that example actually leads uh, directly into the next one that I have, which is illusion of control. Um, uh, an example of this would be somebody developing this super complex uh, model, doing all the work with the most minuscule details of a balance sheet and thinking that that uh, will impact the, their investment returns. And why that's, uh, or that's definitely important to do, to do the work and actually uh, like dig into the financial reports and actually know the companies that you're owning. But it's not necessarily not necessarily true that the more work you do, the the better results you'll get because there's some stuff that you just can't uh, predict in a model. So um, yeah, so sometimes stuff just happens. Like you, there's no there's no amount of fundamental research you can do. And uh, Clorox is a good example that completely blew up during COVID. Uh, there's no amount of fundamental research you could have done in Clorox to predict that uh, it was going to sure. blow up. And then you could make an alternative example for something that sold off during COVID, like the airlines or Carnival Cruise or something like that. Mm-hmm. If you're a big believer that, that the markets truly are efficient, uh, then you would you would argue that maybe that there's not a lot of uh, fruit that goes into that labor because the ability to find something that is undervalued or, or whatever. I, I personally don't believe that the markets are 100% efficient. I think that we're somewhere between a mix of traditional finance, efficient market, and behavioral finance where you've got smart investors, you've got dumb investors, you've got seasoned investors, you've got newbies, and they're all they're all reacting differently to different news. 
and also just like outright manipulation between like with uh with central banks like basically stepping in and providing liquidity when when uh the metaphorical poop hits the fan and then uh like right now what we're going through when inflation gets hot they they smash on the brakes so that those are forces that you're basically trying to predict what uh what an entity is going to do and it's not necessarily and while that impacts like earnings and impacts a lot of stuff with stocks it's not uh it's not something that can be like accurately priced in because it's still like at the whims of a few individuals yeah i think personally i think that's what makes uh investing in energy so difficult as far as timing on things, right? Because you could have the Saudis cut production. I mean, there's certain things that you just really can't predict. You can do as much research as you want, uh, but you're not going to be able to predict events like that. Sure. And then the the last one I have is uh, conservatism bias, which is, um, we were actually just talking about this earlier today, uh, which is anchoring to prior experiences. Um, so a couple examples of this would be um, people that are, very confident in the idea that the Fed is going to print again when, or if if we have a, an economic downturn, or uh, anytime there's an economic downturn, uh, the immediate jump to this is this is the new 2008 financial crisis, and that's just because um, you're just basing what's going on right now to just the most recent memory, like your sure. your most recent prior experience. So with those two examples, you don't um, accurately incorporate the new information where. So if you think the Fed's going to print again, I'm not saying they're not going to print again. I'm just saying you have to incorporate the new information that's not a guarantee because there's inflation this time. And then uh, with this is the new 2008. The new information is they're not uh, overly leveraged on on uh, subprime assets and stuff like that. I mean, it, it could it could ultimately be that bad. We don't know. We don't know if it's going to be bad at all. But uh, the immediate jump to try to draw an analogy to something just in recent memory uh Another another example is like people always draw historical analogies to World War II just because it's so monumental and it's the first one that comes to mind. But it might, it might not be like the perfect analogy. So that's that's something to uh, that's another example. Yeah. So the other thing you you have to think about is you're talking about a downturn. What happens in the next downturn? What happens in the next recession? But then when you look at the economy as a whole, whether you're looking at the U.S. economy or the U.S. economy linked to global economies. That is a complex beast, right? With many, many moving parts and levers, geopolitical issues going on, uh, you name it, right? And so um, to your point, trying to, to identify one thing that's going to result in, in something else, nearly impossible. Yeah, it's always going to be different. Like there's uh, there's no, there's nothing that's going to happen in the future that's going to be the exact same as how it happened in the past. It's like the, it's like a cliche at this point, but like, History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I mean, that is that is true. Derek, interesting stuff. I think um, I think the more that you are in investing, the more you realize it's not a game of math. It's a game of, of the mind, controlling that mind, right? And 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 being able to largely um, largely control your perceptions of how how investment markets work and how you react to it appropriately. Um, I think the biggest weapon that you have as an investor is that time horizon. I'm looking at your uh, your investments and then compartmentalizing them as far as what are short-term, what are long-term investments. And at least it, to me, that helps me from freaking out so much about long-term investments that I'm not touching for another 25 years anyways. So what do I care what they're uh, up or down today? Doesn't doesn't change the course of their trajectory. So I, I heard an interesting stat. I never like went back to, to prove if this is actually true or uh, reference or like go check the references or whatever. So take this with a grain of salt, but this is a stat that I heard. I heard that mutual fund investors outperform ETF investors for the very fact that uh, mutual funds trade at the end of the day. So they're less um, less liquid in the sense that if you wake up in the morning, check your brokerage account and stocks are down 10%, you have to like, you're forced to sit on your hands for at least uh, the trading day. And then it'll, it'll, your trades will close at the end of the day. Um, I don't, I don't know, maybe there's some aspect where, uh, well, I mean, there might just be an aspect of like some people just forget to trade their account by the end of the day or something like that. But when you have the instant liquidity and, and or pretty much instant settlement with an ETF, that kind of like, uh, it creates less friction and be, basically you're able to trade your account more. Yeah. And um, I feel like the most of the time uh, when, you, when you're like thinking that you have to make a trade like in that moment because of... Uh, 
whatever, whatever it's going on in the news or whatever's going on in the market, you're acting on emotion and not necessarily, that's when you forget about your long-term time horizon. And I think that uh, it's just kind of an interesting example. I, I'll try to find the study and maybe post it into the, the comments or something. But uh, if that is true, that, that's a very interesting thing that kind of goes along with what we're talking about. I actually have personal experience with that and I have a couple of thoughts. So I actually had a client one time that said, um, the mutual funds in my 401k must be really good because on days that the market's down, when I look at them, they're not down. And what he was looking at was the previous day's value, right? Because to your point, uh, the mutual fund doesn't do the assess the net asset value until the end of the day, end of the trading day. So, so he's not actually looking at his accounts in real time, even though he thinks he is. So he's looking at the S&P 500 and seeing it's down half a percent today. And his accounts are still un, unchanged, right? And so there is, there is definitely, um, which takes the panic out of him, right? He's, he stops looking at it because, hey, my accounts are still up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting, interesting point where the reason that people move to ETFs are, are, are twofold. One is um, lower cost a lot of times because most ETFs mm -hmm. are, are unmanaged uh, indexes of some, some form. The other thing is um, with an ETF, you typically don't get as much pass through taxes. If it's an unmanaged ETF, if I'm holding a large cap fund, uh, and, I, and on the other end, I've got a, the Contra Fund, Fidelity Contra Fund, which is a managed mutual fund, that manager is buying and selling things, right? So even though, even though I hold the Contra Fund for the entire year and I don't sell it, I could actually still get uh, capital gains uh, that I have to file my taxes for, for for sales that the manager of that fund made, right? But, but I think what ends up happening, Derek, is because there's less friction in that ETF, people end up trading them more. They end up making more money. So the, what they saved in cost, they make up in mental blunders. And then they're also creating their own taxable mm -hmm. events by, by trading that account too much. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, really interesting. Anything else to add? I, d I didn't have anything else. Sorry, it seems like we had some technical difficulties there. So uh, hopefully when it, when it adds together, you guys won't notice them, but on our end, we had a couple of technical difficulties. Yeah. I want to mention, I know a lot of folks are probably listening to this on uh, Spotify or, or Apple Podcasts, but Derek, your hair has really come back uh, from the last haircut you got. So I want to say it's looking good again. Yeah, I had to get it. I had to get it fixed. I was the, that was probably the worst haircut I've ever had. And then uh, I had to get it fixed the next day. It was terrible. <laughs> Keep in mind that, uh, well, Derek, where can people find us on social media? As always, thanks everybody for listening to the podcast. If you liked it, like, share, subscri subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube at Crosby Advisory. And we'll see you guys next week. Keep in mind that Crosby Advisory is a registered investment advisor in the state of Ohio, Texas, and Florida. At any time, you can request our forms ADV 2A and 2B, which go into the business practices and qualifications of Crosby Advisory. Today on the show, we mentioned specific securities, and that is not a recommendation for you to buy them or sell them. Do your own homework. Keep in mind. Investing is a process that includes risk, including the potential loss of principal.